Observations wherever you may be. We've got uh, Kirk here, and uh, maybe uh, get some input along the way from uh, from Scott. It's been a couple of weeks since uh, we uh, did a program. I'm uh, glad to be back with you. For for those who have uh, followed along and sent me best wishes on the recovery for my uh, knee surgery, uh, you must have been really good at it because uh, I didn't end up having knee surgery. Um, as it turns out, uh, I embarked in a series of stretching and icing uh, exercises, followed by uh, a reduction in pain to the point where I could start exercising between an hour and two a day. And, and then I got some physical therapy on advice on how to approach the exercise in the most beneficial way and, and what stretches to do. And while my knee is still a, um, a mess, Based on the MRIs and the uh, x-rays uh, that were taken uh, a month ago, I have no pain whatsoever and full uh, use of it. And it, uh, the surgeon, the about six hours before the surgery, the surgeon um, uh, did an examination and said, you know, you're doing more good with your um, your exercise than I can do with a knife right at the moment. Let's, uh, let's postpone it. Now, now you can ballroom dance. <laughs> Yeah, I can. I can indeed. I can. In fact, I, right now it's really weird. I can do most anything except um, there are um, uh, certain um, restrictions in terms of twisting that would not be conducive. And uh, since it's a meniscus tear, there's two positions with the leg you're, you're supposed to avoid: full extension uh, in or full uh, or out, and and full uh, bend inward because that puts the most pressure on the meniscus. But if I avoid those, you're good to go. Shoot, no, I'm good to go. Can exercise, you know, two three hours a day, which is uh, what I really need to do to get you know my weight back down and get back in shape and feel my best. And well, I am uh, I'm on the mend. So well, that, that, that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, Haven't spent is. a lot of time though, you know. Just um, <clears throat> well, I continue to, to translate and write uh, the new chapter, and and I want to thank. Um, um, all the people, and there's been so many that have contributed to editing the first uh, volume. We're really close to uh, uh, publishing the first volume of Observations. And I'm working to complete the second volume of Observations. Both will be about 775 pages, so there, it's a significant body of work. Mm-hmm. But if you were to tell me something that's going on in the news right now, I think I'd be clueless. Yeah, <laughs> it's one of the, <laughs> I removed a lot of things from my life. Oh, and the other thing I want to say is for those who who write emails, I've really uh, last night for the first time I tried to respond to a few of them, and they're marvelous emails. I've got people that I had not met yet uh, who had uh, come to know Yawa either through the books and uh, these uh, programs, and were appreciative of of where they were now and how they had gotten there. Um, but uh, I have been a a very tardy. Uh, email responder uh, during this uh, time, so I apologize You're for that. <laughs> well, you know what I what I found out, and I didn't know it, is that I was far more stressed over this than I probably should have been, and and my stress was uh, was mainly this idea that if I went ahead with the surgery, I was going to be down for ten to twelve weeks, mm-hmm. and the idea of uh, of you know being incapacitated for that period of time, you know, you, you gradually regain mobility and strength back and you, you gradually earn the right to be able to exercise and, and, and do the things that normal of life. Mm-hmm. That's a long time to, uh, to give up. And, uh, I became increasingly stressed about the idea of giving up that much time. So, uh, the miraculous, uh, <laughs> cure of the Nina, you know, I laugh because, you know, one of the things I never asked for, and I, uh, I don't really believe in, is uh, miraculous physical cures. I've never asked for one. Do not believe in them. Um, 
and uh, you know I, I think that we actually grow and there's and there's you know the the fact that we have pains in our everyday life like you have a, a bad back um those those things actually reinforce a why we don't want physical bodies in eternity and uh, make us uh, our mindset is uh, is far more comfortable on uh, knowing where we're going considering where we currently are certainly i'm ready to go I yeah. Can't any old time. <laughs> yeah i mean i have to tell you i'm really enjoying uh, yeah. life. So, uh, you know, I have, uh, but I mean, you know, yeah, so, you know, it's kind of one of those funny things that, that because I know that time now is so limited, mm-hmm. I would love to extend it. Yeah. And I mean, uh, you know, I know it's coming and, uh, but life is wonderful. I, I really, um, I'm in, I'm in no hurry to go. And, and I also realized that what we have left here in, uh, in the, the current situation, is limited to you know very few years. Even at the very end of it, it's uh, twenty thirty three, mm-hmm. and and of course some fifteen years. Uh, yeah, it. yeah. And then at the, um, um, but eternity is forever. Mm-hmm. So we're not shortchanging our opportunity to enjoy um, seven dimensional uh, bodies. You know, I don't use the term body as physical, but it being a seven dimensional pain, we have all eternity. Yeah, we're, we're not. Yeah, we're not shortchanging that at all. No. To uh, to more fully enjoy where we are. We have plenty of time. We do have plenty of time. <laughs> so I want to pick up uh, Kirk where we were. I appreciate you uh, reminding me so thoughtfully before we began today. But um, Barashith in the beginning, Genesis thirteen seventeen is uh, where we left off two weeks ago. I'll uh, I'll read and we'll let's talk about it a bit. Okay. This is Yahweh speaking. Uh, that's important because he just happens to be God. Um, and he's speaking to his uh, new uh, BFF, uh, best friend forever, Abram. And he says, choose of your own free will to actually stand up. I like to rise up on your feet. Take a stand. Be established. Fulfill your purpose. Enabling the means of restoration. <laughs> That's from whom? One of my very favorite Hebrew words. Mm-hmm. Electing to walk independently and of your own volition. Halak. Both of these two verbs were written in the imperative mood. Second person choice. So electing to walk independently and of your own free will. It's interesting that uh, halak um, was scribed here with a very unusual stem. Hit pile stem occurs very infrequently. And what the hit pile stem says is that what you're choosing, when it, particularly when it's blended with the imperative mood, which is volition, it says that, that, that what you are going to do, if you choose to do it, mm-hmm. is being done without any outside influence. In fact, completely apart from outside influences. This is your choice. This is your choice alone. And it's not influenced by anyone else out there. No, no societal custom, no religion, no politics, no force, no compulsion. If you make this choice, it is completely and totally your own. It's it's God saying, I'm not going to even pressure you. I'm most certainly not going to compel you or order you, but I'm not going to even apply the slightest amount of pressure. And, you know, when it comes to getting what he wants done, yeah, you'd have to say that God was in a position to apply about as much pressure as, oh, yeah. Yeah, as he wants to. He wants it done. It's done. But, but. He, he didn't want to apply. He didn't. He's saying with that particular stem that, no, this is not only of your own initiative, but you're walking independently. Powerful uh, concept, the uh, hit pile stem. It's not used very often, but when it's used... What does it tell you about Yahweh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's it's why I, I love uh, Hebrew with these uh, with the stems, the conjugations, and the the moods. Mm-hmm. Is that, you know, sometimes you can just read right over them, and it's not that big a deal. But there are times, like this one, 
where Yahweh is giving an instruction to Abram. And it's an instruction regarding the covenant and the way he shapes it, making it subject to free will, uh, letting Abram know that he's not going to apply any pressure. This is not only isn't he going to apply any pressure, but that this choice is completely independent. You're not going to find anybody else walking with him. Mm-hmm. Go through the door by yourself. You're going by yourself of your own initiative. You know, I might walk there, walk through it with you. I might be welcome, waiting on the other side to greet you when you walk through it. Mm-hmm. But your choice to to walk through that door is not only yours. There is no one in society that's going to support what you're doing. Is that you what scares everybody? Are on your own. Yeah, I think so. I think that is the. Uh, I think that's the scariest thing. I think. I think there's two scary things about leaving religion to accept Yahweh's invitation to walk independently of our own initiative. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe there's a lot of things, but one of the things is that it's scary because, well, you're walking the opposite way of everybody else. Right. You're going to be ostracized by those who are walking in a different direction. They're not going to like it. You aren't going to find very many people walking with you, and initially you'll find no one walking with you. Right. (laughs) Most people don't have the courage to go to such places, to take such risks. Now, in this case, there really is no risk because Yahweh cannot renege on a promise, but... While you're initially in it and you don't know him all that well, yeah, that's a big risk. So I think there's lots of reasons. And, of course, you're now going down a path where there is no hope and trust in religion or government. So all those things that might have made you comfortable, my government is protecting my freedom, my government is is fighting for my independence. My government will take care of me in old age. My I government will yeah, support my retirement. My religion will save me. Because of my religion, I will see my loved ones who are dearly departed again in heaven. Those comfort people. Now, they're all false hope, which is the cruelest thing of all. Yeah. But they comfort people. The sales pitch of religion. You know, we we let, let me ask you something. Mm-hmm. I was thinking about this offer a lot after I, I translated as much as I could and, and looked up as much as I could, and I was thinking about um, what differentiates differentiated us from uh, mankind as, in general with Adam, the line of Adam, because of the nasama. Mm-hmm. And when you have a nasama, well, first of all, you couldn't have a relationship with Yahweh without it. Because you would be an animalistic, and all they ever said about the animals is they were good. They were told they, they functioned well. Everything worked to plan. But until he came up with Adam and gave him an Osama, yes. uh, that's the only way he could be with someone and have a type of relationship he was looking for, because obviously we uh, we have to be able to be rational and, and make a choice to choose him, mm-hmm. as Adam did. Correct. And what, what was... Um, so... If if that's the the criteria, I was thinking about what you were just saying about his words. Then become um, how can I put it? The his words I think are so powerful because I was looking at this story and I said this is the most beautiful offer in the world. Yes, it is, and it should be the most uh, appealing thing in the world. And, yes. and why is it always twisted? Because it's pretty easy to follow if it's translated correctly in English. Yes. So I would assume it's pretty easy to follow if you were natural, if you were speaking Hebrew, normally without all the bells and whistles they've added to it. So you should be able to say, this is pretty straightforward. This is a guy who's communicating to me very clearly what he wants or what the eighth offer is. Yet religions can twist this thing so easily and everybody falls for it. And I was trying to think as I was reading this and trying to figure out why everybody doesn't jump on board to this or why a larger number doesn't jump on board to this. 
What is it about it that, is it just the fact that Satan could twist a little bit and God's words, even a little bit of God's words, are so attractive that he could attract them that way? You, am I making uh, yeah, I'm yeah, very clear? Yeah, I want to I sh- uh, share with you what, something that I think is, uh, is true and profound in this regard. Okay. I think the reason that Yahweh wanted this book written, mm-hmm. I think the reason that it just lays out exactly what you've discussed so clearly, so forthrightly, I just, well, all we're doing is putting it into his words. We don't get any credit for that, although we get to enjoy the, we get to celebrate it right along with everyone else. Is that the reason this, the most rewarding, most wonderful offer that has ever been given to anyone at any time in the entire universe throughout its history is they don't know it. They're completely unaware of it. Now, why would they be unaware of it? Well, let's begin with socialist secular humanists, which represents probably the the largest segment of the the world, if particularly if you right. yeah, if you include the people who are communists and atheists and agnostics, but socialist secular humanists, they wouldn't, if their life depended on it, read these stories. And if they read the book of Barashith Genesis in the Torah, they were so preconditioned to think that that's a mean, wrathful God out of uh, touch with the modern sensibilities that it was the uh, a story created by these uh, desert wanderers, wanderers that uh, mm-hmm. just um, a bunch of old Bedouins. Uh, yeah, that uh, that concocted this uh, this as one of many fables. And the world is filled with religious fables. Another myth. So they have been conditioned to believe that, A, this is a fable, stories that have no basis in, in history, and that the God who inspired it was imaginary, as all gods are have been throughout human history except Yahweh. And that this God represents, and this book represents, the antithesis of what they have been led to embrace and believe. You know, they want multiculturalism. They want to be tolerant, to be accepting. Uh, And every aspect of socialist, secular humanism, particularly political correctness, where lies are preferable to the truth, is creates a mindset and a perspective that there are more than a billion people in this world who, A, would never consider reading this, and B, would have no hope of understanding it. Their mindset is just Too far. not, well, yeah, it's not where it needs to be. Okay, now let's go to Christians. What have they been told? They've been told that this, uh, the, uh, the God of the Old Testament failed so badly that he created such a horrible, mean-spirited, arcane plan that his way is incapable of saving anyone, that no one can be saved by the Torah. And that that's why God, in desperation, went to Paul and uh, and had Paul come up with what I, Paul, say. I'm sorry, God in desperation went to... Yeah, I mean, you know, it was... Uh, you know, we need to find ourselves a sexual pervert here. Yeah, we need to find ourselves a uh, a, uh, a maniacal, failed rabbi mm-hmm. who hates life in the world, mm-hmm. who is demon-possessed, and we're going to have him fix all this for us because, gosh, you know, we need a different plan. This one's not working. No, there's no Christian that would phrase it that way, but that's that's the essence of yeah, Paul's letters. Yeah, yeah. It's the essence of Christianity. The God of the Old Testament screwed up. He was mean. Yeah. We need a a new love, all loving God, all accepting God. Screw this knowing stuff. That's too much work. It's going to be faith based, and we're going to have Jesus Christ. Be uh, be our God. 
Yeah, a god small enough to fit into a human body. Hmm, but, I but if tell you, you have something. this new god of Paul, then you you hate women. Yes. Which is half more than half of the population of the world. And, <laughs> and that's not and good for the women. That's not good for the women. Not good for the. By the way, that's not good for the men either. No, and any and any man that that you can't stand yeah. Yehudim and Israel. That's right. I mean, <laughs> this is not good, and you have to be irrational because uh, yeah, Paul's absolutely. claims are absolutely irrational. There isn't a sane human being that can read Paul's letters and uh, and think that they are true. You, so you have to be irrational. You, you've got to base it on faith because you can't base it on reality. Yep, that's a problem. So you got to chuck your brain and throw it away to do that. But, Kirk, mm-hmm. there are 2.5 billion people today who've done that very thing. Oh, yeah. 2.5 billion Christian morons out there. Mm-hmm. So stupid it hurts. Incapable of even seeing that there's no commonality whatsoever between Paul and their supposed Jesus Christ. They're in complete and total conflict. And that Paul is in total and complete conflict with the God he said picked him and inspired him. They're morons. Every Christian out there. Absolute nincompoops. So they don't know about the simplicity of the covenant offer and its beauty. Because by not thinking, they have bought into the drivel that God failed in his Torah plan and had to have Paul come up with a faith-based religion. They don't even consider it. Wouldn't even, wouldn't even for the moment, because they'll tr- jump around and they'll uh, tick out a story. They may want to talk about Adam one day or Satan another day in the garden, or they may want to tell the story of the flood, or they may have a favorite Abraham story. Mm-hmm. But that's it. They may to a sermon on the on creation, but they'll screw every word of it up. It's true. So they don't consider it. That's the reason. Yeah. If you're a, you know, there's 1.5 billion Muslims out there, and I use Muslim because it is the slimiest, most disgusting religion in the world. If you're a Muslim, it's worse than you being a nincompoop. You have to be a, an absolute unthinking blob, a, a zombie yeah. You're, you're not even human if you're a Muslim. And I say that because if you read the Quran, it is the most goddamn awful, pathetic, worthless book ever written. There is no book ever that is as stupid, as irrational, cruel, cruel, absolutely disgusting, moronic as the Quran. It is absolutely the most goddamn piece of trash ever published. And Muhammad was a scum. You know, why would you be a Muslim when Muhammad was a pedophile, a rapist, a terrorist, a mass murderer, an avowed liar? Why would you follow the advice of the most disgusting man who ever lived? I mean, you've got to be a complete and absolute idiot. And every claim of the Quran is untrue. But the Quran says, oh, no, no, this, this confirms the Torah. And, uh, and therefore, you don't need to read the Torah because this piece of trash confirms it. That's the antithesis of the Torah. Now, that alone should be enough for any thinking person to throw the goddamn Quran away. And I keep on using goddamn because it is the... It's, it's the yeah, best. If yeah, wants to be separated from that, y'all would. Definitely. That's right. That's right. It is goddamn. It is purely satanic. But so is Pauline Christianity. It's purely satanic. So the answer to your question, if you go to the those three blocks of people, they don't consider it. But I want to go one step further. Well, even even the Hindus, they just they just have such a plethora of every kind of god there is and anything you want and. 
Okay, yeah, to- total that's tolerance, that's total into- total intolerance. I mean, the yeah. uh, the way that uh, that religious Hindus treat uh, women, particularly oh, their women daughters, right. is just despicable. And the caste system of uh, it's, oh, it's the caste system that grew out of it, it is it is it is reprehensible. Yeah. So, you know, I I'm not an expert in it. I've been there. Mm-hmm. I've seen it. I've read uh, about it. Uh, I'm not an expert on it. And yeah, I, I'm leaving a billion people out by not addressing uh, Hinduism. Um, but that's about. But, that, but, but that's your uh, that's your own damn fault. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm I'm not here to be the answer person for everybody. No, no. But I'm going to give you one more answer. Okay. Jews. They speak this language. Most of them do. Yeah, most of them speak or. or their primary language for most Jews they can is navigate English. pretty easily, but they can read it. They can read it in Hebrew. Now they're reading the Masoretic, and there's some you know spots here and there. The Masoretic isn't really good, and and part of the thing is that languages evolve, and uh, and so they're not considering the words as they in their meaning at the time they were given, which these lexicons and dictionaries enable us to do. They're considering the meaning of the words as they have evolved over time. So there's some limitations to what they're doing, but they're they're able to pick it up and read it. But they don't. And the reason they don't is twofold. One is those who are religious have no interest in the Torah. For them, their Torah is the Talmud. They're interested in the Talmud and the Mishnah. The rabbinical arguments They've been led to believe and have embraced the notion that that is the most appropriate source for them to consider. They've been hoodwinked into believing that there was a second Torah, one not written down, that was somehow... The oral law. Yeah, picked up the oral law that was picked up by the elders, who were nameless, and passed on orally through the generations. And that oral tradition, with all of its laws, is uh, superior to what God not only inspired, but proved he inspired through prophecy and historical accuracy in the actual Torah that was written down. Now, that perspective is moronic. But again, it says that religious people don't think. It's irrational to take that position but they do and so the 30 to 40 percent of jews who are religious don't even consider they would never read this story and consider the implications of each of these words and of course 60 to 70 percent of jews aren't religious they fall back into the socialist secular humanist position now the interesting thing though about Jews who are socialist, secular humanists. They're actually open to the truth. They know deep inside. I know there's a God. They don't know him, but they know he's there. And they know that Israel is special to him. Mm -hmm. And they know that there's a connection that goes all the way back through them to God's revelation to humankind. They know that exists. They, But, you know, they're too busy and too occupied with life to give it its due. So, therefore, between now and the time of, uh, of the great divide that is coming, it's only those who Yahweh has reached out to and say, tapped on the shoulder and pointed in the right direction, introduced himself who have given up the time, chosen of their own free will, to stand up against the rest of society, to stand up with God, which is the opposite of bowing down. So they're they're going to take a stand against societal influences, and they're going to walk away from them independently of their own initiative. That's, you know, one in, what, a million people? Yeah. At best. Yeah. At best. The story is the same for them as it is for everyone else. They're just open to it. 
And uh, there are more know. Jews that are open to it than any other form of uh, any other group of socialist secular humanists. Yeah, absolutely. I, I used to it used to concern me that the numbers were so few, and and you know, and and then everyone asked that question, you know, well, why not all these people, and why not my relatives, and all the really nice people, and so forth. You know, the more we've studied the past year and a half on um, man, one of Osama, and how they became uh, Nephilim. Uh, Nephilim, which I have, or the proper pronunciation is, mm-hmm. whatever. The um, if if you if you think about this story, what Yah was about to offer uh, Abraham about yes. turning him into light. Yes. If these people, if, if if a person who is not on board with this agreement, really in their heart and the deepest. In, deepest part of their soul, if they're not on board with this, if he, he tries, you know, he, he gives us, he gives human beings, all of a sudden, an Asama, a handful of them follow him, and the rest of them destroy the world. They're about to destroy it again, or they would have destroyed it, at least the region, uh, with uh, the flood. If he were to allow these people into his home, Yes, and then empower them uh, on Shabuah. No, yep, yep. My God, we'd, we'd be right back to uh, Holocaust yeah, time, I mean, wouldn't we? No, no, not where we are now. I mean, this they uh-huh. would go through seven uh, <laughs> dimensions of power. I mean, they could. Yes. Just, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, on steroids, man. Yeah. yeah. God's got to be really careful who He empowers it this way. Yeah. And it's attitudinal. What's your attitude towards all this? No, it's not just what you know and understand. Well, that's vitally important. Yes. It's what you choose independently and over your own initiative. What do you choose to do? <laughs> well, doesn't that explain why he's not going to encourage him? I mean, he's encouraging him, but he's not yeah. going to help him. He's going to say, okay, you got you got to do this. There's a heck of a test to enter the, the covenant. Yeah. You can't pass that test. You're not welcome in. And it has to be that way. Because the covenant children receive such an, an enrichment and empowerment that God's got to be careful. Otherwise, they'll ruin eternity for everyone, including him. Yeah. But isn't it interesting to who the, the, uh, these two words are juxtaposed? Kum and halak. Mm-hmm. Both verbs. Yes. And both verbs are the antithesis of man's way. Kum. Stand up. Stand up, not bow down. Right. Stand up on your feet. You know, it's it's like uh, I was explaining to somebody uh, the other day, Jacob's name. Mm-hmm. Means, you know, to dig in your heels. You know, to... to, uh, to just, yeah. yeah, just stand up against the influences that will pull you from one side to another. Take a stand. That's, you know, it's a referendum here. You're going to be with man or against man? Pro-government or anti-government? Pro-religion or anti-religion? You're going to go along with the flow of society or go in the opposite direction? Do you have a backbone? And here is the creator of the universe saying something that should be profound, should profoundly resonate with everyone. And yet it's the opposite of what is presented by religion about God. It's the least considered of all things. Right. Rather than telling man, bow down and worship me, he's saying, stand up. Walk to me. Let's go take a walk. Mm -hmm. Walk to me, walk with me. Engage. Engage. Stand up. Walk. To do that, by the way, your eyes have to be open. Otherwise, it's not going to turn out very well for you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Bow down and clo- close your eyes and bow down. You know how you how you uh, enter Christianity. Uh, you know, on the, it's bow. No, no, no. Stand up and walk independently of your own free will. And it's God. To, you know the religion thing was you either do this or oh boy, you're going to get toasty in hell. Mm-hmm. Does God ever mention Sheol, hell? No. In any conversation relative to the covenant, if you don't choose this, that's where you're going to go. 
What kind of a father would say, you either do everything that I tell you to do. Well, then you're cursing. You or I'm going to torture it. you for the rest right. of your life. Yeah. Are you kidding? What kind of status do you want? Right. So want be? why would yeah. people project on God through religion, as Islam and Christianity do, that if you don't acquiesce to what he is saying, then he's going to see to it that you, your little soul is tortured forever in hell. Here's a big deal. If you're trying to control the masses. Yeah. But fear has no place in a loving relationship. No. None. Fear has no place in a family. I was uh, listening to uh, my wife tell a story um, uh, about a, uh, I guess it was something she was, she was watching on TV, but it was a uh, one of those uh, ER programs and this uh, girl was 14 years old, and she was living on the street. She And living on the street, the reason she was in the ER is that uh, she actually had cockroaches, live cockroaches, living up in the upper reaches of her sinuses. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they, they finally resolved the, uh, the problem for her, and the protocol says she's a minor, 14 years old. She has to be released to her family. And she just begged, no, 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 anything but that. She was on the street because her father beat her. Mm-hmm. And so they were confronted with, well, if we le- release her to, to Child's Protective Services, they're eventually going to send her right back to her family. Because he hadn't been convicted of this. She didn't want to go home because home it's horrible. was a source of, of pain. Yeah. Now, I want to put that into the mindset, that's the religious God. That's most certainly Allah, and it's most certainly the Jesus Christ of Christianity. You either bow down and lift me up in praise and and do your little confession, or I'm going to send your sorry tale to hell where it will burn, be tortured forever. What's the difference? between that girl's plight and the religious God. None. <laughs> it really is none. No. You know, a God would only have heaven and hell isn't worth knowing. I don't want to spend... Would you want to spend eternity with a God who says, if you step out of line, off to the fires of hell you go? It was one of the reasons that early on in this process, you know, I... Uh, I celebrated the realization, and I was just so astounded that it hadn't been discussed, written about, shared. And certainly 2,500 years, no one had had said a single thing about this in 2,500 years. But the primary destination for the preponderance of human souls is neither heaven nor hell but simply ceasing to exist. No pain, no punishment. You were given a mortal life. You had the opportunity to learn, to know, to respond. And if you squandered it, your life wasn't shortchanged. You had your mortal life. Mm -hmm. When it's over, you only exist in, in the memories of those that your life interacted with. And that's the vast preponderance of souls. They just simply cease to exist. And, of course, uh, then all the world's leaders, religious and political and military, they're headed to Sheol. And rightfully so. And rightfully so. There has to be a consequence of leading people in the wrong direction. So, you know, there, there's no consequence, no penalty for... There's a consequence, there's just not a penalty for being led in the wrong direction. The consequence for being led in the wrong direction is your soul ceases to exist at the end of your mortal life. Mm -hmm. But there's a penalty of leading people in the wrong direction by being a military leader, a political leader, a societal leader, a government leader, a religious leader. And the penalty has to be there. God has to hate that which is harmful to his children. Otherwise, he's not loving. And therefore, there's a penalty for those people, and it's a express ticket to S.H.I.E.L.D. And as I translate more and more of Yashaya, it's absolutely evident, and it's all of them. 
all of the people on that list, all of the high and mighty in the world are going to be debased in Sheol. But there's no tortures in Sheol, even there. It's just eternal incarceration. And mental anguish. With, yeah, mental well, anguish. it's the mental I'm anguish because, because, yeah, because at that point, you are going to know because you have now been judged mm-hmm. that there really was a God and it was a hell of a lot better path to uh, through life and that you're going to spend eternity with people just like you. That's not so good. Mm-mm. <laughs> They're miserable. And so, I mean, that's the, that's the pain associated with Sheol. It's a lightless place where God is not. There are no tortures. There are no fires. But there is the eternal knowledge that you made a really bad decision and led people the wrong way. And as a consequence, you're going to spend eternity with people just like you. And, of course, for those, Kirk, that read what Yahweh is offering, consider it, agree with it, come to understand it, act upon it, buy of terms and conditions of the covenant, they uh, receive its five benefits. They're become immortal, they're perfected, they're adopted into Yahweh's family, they're enriched, they're empowered. They get to spend eternity as as a spiritual being and experience what it means to be seven-dimensional. These are good things. But, boy, that was a long answer to your question, wasn't it? Well, no, it's, it's, a, it's a good answer. And it's, and it's really important in the context of what we're studying, because this is... Surely, when you look at if this is the, this is the only Bible, this is the only deal y'all offer. This is the only deal he offers. He's only got one deal. That's all made, That's right. made crap. You know? Right, right. This is his this only is the deal. The only one he's offered, and is in and, and uh, uh, take it or leave it. So yeah, take it or leave it. You start thinking about all the other concepts that everyone has, and you go, "What are you nuts?" And and even if they even if they were somehow to resonate worthwhile to you. Put next to this is a crooked stick next to a straight stick. I mean, come on, who yeah. would turn this down? If you thought about it, if you if yeah. you had a brain, how could you how could you say no? My, thanks. My perception, Kirk, is that of those who are genuinely willing mm-hmm. to listen, and they uh, come to understand, and they really come to understand what God is uh, is offering here, mm-hmm. uh, what He is requiring of us. Not commands, you have to do it of your own free will. But um, what he's requiring for us, which is to walk away from politics and from religion, from societal customs, from the family of man, and to walk to, um, to God, to become perfect by walking the path that he has provided, which is Pesach, Matzah, Bakotam, Shabuah, uh, Teruah, Kaporam, and, uh, and Sukkah. To accept those invitations and walk to him and become perfected by him. And then to get to know him and what he is offering and who he is well enough to be able to trust and rely upon him. Coming to understand each of these terms and conditions of the relationship and what they represent. That until... You know, your mindset is entirely different until you're willing to invest the time, until you're open to go where the words lead. Who's going to read it? Who's going to care? Yeah. What a shame, because in, in this time, we can actually read all this stuff. We can look up all this stuff. You know, uh, <laughs> you know James uh, uh, did a program with me, or I did a program with him, actually. Uh, or we did this thing together, and he's... Um, going through everything that you need to translate and so forth, and I threw in my two cents. And uh, when I, the more and more I thought about it, my gosh, what a time to live in because we can we can look up everything. It's not. Right. I mean, if I just presented to you this wonderful offer and said, you should study this, you're not left out in the blue. You don't have to go get a lawyer to get, you know, read the contract. You know, you can absolutely find this relatively easy. You have to put yes. some effort in, you have to put some time in it, but it's not so cerebral you can't get there. 
Otherwise, I couldn't get there. Yeah. They, uh, and, you know, and why, why don't you why don't you uh, elaborate the skill set and the credentials I brought to this? Uh, okay, well, that was very good. That was very good. Uh, and that's a complete list. Yeah. yeah. So if I didn't have any credentials, no skill yeah. set at all that would impress I anybody, no, no I training just, I whatsoever. I said, okay, let's study. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If I could figure it out, anybody can. Yeah, that's the way I look at me. I mean, you, no. you can, if you, if you have the want to, <laughs> yes. you can do this. <laughs> Correct. Now, it takes a lot of time. Yeah, it does. It takes focus. You've got to prioritize it in your life. You know, it's kind of interesting. I've been thinking a lot of uh, Doe David recently. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Doe to David for a period probably of, what, um, 30 or 40 years mm-hmm. was the primary oracle of Yahweh. Right. Knew Yahweh better than anyone. Understood what he was offering better than anyone. Lived as Yahweh's son. Wrote these marvelous psalms and proverbs. And enjoyed uh, a life that, you know, few of us could even imagine. And I wondered, so what then happened to this man? You know, really all we know in his later life is he settled in with Bathsheba and, and, um, and for the most part, what he was called to do was done. And, you know, you look at, at, um, at what we're doing here. He, what the Dode gave us is the roadmap, mm-hmm. the compass to understand the Torah, how to observe it, how to get right. the most out of it. His life symbolizes what it means to be a child of the covenant. And he wrote about that in the Proverbs. Then, you know, at one point said, thank you. You've done it. You've done what I've asked you to do. You know, it's just time to to relax a little bit, my son. There'll be eternity to celebrate uh, all of this, but what a treasure mm-hmm. he left behind and for all of us over those years that he and Yahweh were, were father and son. You know, they're still father and son, but... They were engaged as father and son. Man, they were working as father and son. They opened up a father and son shop that was the light of the world. So anyway, this begins. Choose of your own volition to actually stand up, electing to walk independently of your own initiative. Through and within the land, the realm, approaching her length, in addition to her breadth. Because for you to approach, I am genuinely giving her to you forever. The reference to standing up and walking through and within the land, I don't think has, I think has everything to do with Israel and nothing to do with Israel all at the same time. It's by the way, that's part of the uh, the Hebrew poetic mindset. It can be something can be completely literal and completely metaphorical. Yes, same thing. And and both can be right. Sure. And this was absolutely literal as it relates to uh, the land of Israel. Mm-hmm. And it's absolutely metaphorical as it speaks to us. The land of Israel represents Yahweh's realm here on earth. It is what we walk through when we're engaged in a relationship with him. It's what we walk within when we're part of his family. It is his home on earth. And while it is a physical place, that physical place has become so polluted, there is a a perfect Yisrael that exists within the Torah, that exists within our minds when we come to know who God is and what he's offering. But the land represents Yahweh's home. Mm-hmm. You know, Yahweh's home is not constrained by walls. People think, well, that's the, the temple of Solomon and the uh, second temple. 
Now, it's not constrained by walls. That's why God said, you know, if the the Romans want to knock it down, so what? The Babylonians want to knock it down. I don't really care. It's never about the building. It's never about the walls. It's not even about the Temple Mount. No. My home is Yisrael. My home, like any really large and wonderful home, has a yard to roam around in. That yard, Yahweh's yard, is Yisrael. And, you know, most really enjoyable homes to bring a family, you know, you watch a show on these uh, on these home things, and they always talk about how important it is to have a yard that the children can play. Well, Yisrael is the yard for Yahweh's covenant children to play. It's his home. And so long as you understand it metaphorically, symbolically, then you're walking in it just as Abram had the opportunity to do. Mm-hmm. And then he says, approaching her length and breadth. Yeah. Well, Israel literally has a certain width and a certain length. It's a little tiny, insignificant yes. speck on the yeah, the landmass of the world. What about two um, one hundredths of one percent? Insignificant. That's why uh, the religious covet it so, why the political covet it so, because of its symbolic significance. And so Abraham had the opportunity to do that. And my guess is he never did walk the uh, the length or the width of of Israel. But what God is saying is, my home's expansive. I want you to take a mental walk through it. I want you to go left and right, up and down, back and forth. Really test and explore where the parameters are in my home. His home's the universe. His home is seven That's dimensions. That's consistent with the words, you know. Pardon? That's consistent with the words. Our rock is, is always, almost always of time. You know, when it describes being long, or mm-hmm. like, and it's forevermore, is a, is another. When you look those words up and roll call, yeah, up, yeah, like, or, or rock, you always yeah. talk about right. largeness of understanding, which I thought was very unique, very uh, insightful, rather. Yeah, you just you right. You look at the words arak, which is the word for length, mm-hmm. and I translated it in bold, approaching her length. It means to be prolonged in life, the proper way. To continuously grow in a manner that is fitting. It's from Iraq. To prolong and grow continuously in a way that is proper, reaching the goal, which is to meet one another. Mm-hmm. Folks. Every one of those can apply to eternal life. Right. He's not talking about a piece of dirt. No. He's talking about prolonging your life the proper way so that one day we meet. Isn't that a great word? Yeah. <laughs> when you look at it that way, rather than, I mean, you say length, you just say, okay, a measurement, you can do a football field, big deal. Yeah, but it's prolonged he's life is what about, it means. He's right. about this space. I mean, Correct. he is, but he isn't, you know. He's Correct. talking about much bigger things than this. Yeah, and remember I said that Yahweh's home does not have any limitations. You know what Rokab means with the word that it translated in yep. bold breath? Yes, it's a, uh, well, I can tell you it means to in large extent, uh, grow, to be mm-hmm. enlarged, enriched, enlightened, empowered. So, I mean, that's, uh, yeah. that's a little bit... Like in, 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 yeah, and how about adding, it means to lack limitations. Right. To be outstanding, spacious, agreeable, pleasant, a vast expanse, a great dwelling. And the immensity of spatial dimensions. And it's from rakab, which is a very simple verb. I mean, rokab is not hard to figure this out, folks. Is from rakab. The verb, the actionable use of the word, defines it as to grow and expand in dimensions, having one's life greatly enhanced, creating a vastly more favorable circumstance with unbounded opportunities, alleviating 
every troublesome thing and anxiety. Yeah, I found also rejoice and uh, speak boldly. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> no, all of the above. If you don't take the time to look at these jewels, each word is a jewel. You know, I, I was accused early on of making a religion out of these words. Yeah, <laughs> I would say more correctly, I have a passion for these words. I have a, I'm have, zealous about these words. I have an enthusiasm for these words. Why? Because each one of these words is a beautiful facet on the world's most exquisite diamond. These words tell you everything you need to know about who God is and what he's offering. Prolonged life. A complete lack of limitations. You know, right now we're limited because we are in decaying physical bodies. Mm-hmm. We're limited by gravity. We're limited in time. We don't even understand the fifth and sixth dimension, much less the seventh. We can't even comprehend it. We are so limited. And what he says, I'm willing to offer you to a status where you are unlimited. And the other word, Iraq, I'm going to prolong your life the proper way. And then I'm going to eliminate all limitations. And that could be a full stop. Why would you even need you? <laughs> At that point, why not just accept his invitation? Yeah, I'm in. I'm all in. Yeah, I'm all in. But to know it... You've got to want to know it. You've got to, as you say, you've got to have the want to. Yeah. It's there. Yeah. You looked up, uh, I mean, here, I was expansive in my definition of a rec length and of rakob breadth. You looked it up, found the same thing, didn't you? Oh, yeah, I found all the same things you did, plus uh, some little wrinkles Before. here and there, which I thought uh, were uh, just depend on what lexicon, on how well the guy thought about it. But mm-hmm. uh, almost always the time to be long. <clears throat> We're not talking about a measurement per se. You're talking about uh, uh, eternity, growth, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, expansion. Yeah. It, what's, you know, the, it, what's the single most important aspect of a relationship and of, of, uh, of a child's life? Isn't it to grow? Absolutely. That's what he's offering. Now, he's offering these things, a prolonged life the proper way, and being unlimited in spatial dimensions and everything else, expansive, because for you to approach key, for the express reason, (laughs) la'ata, for you to come near, I am genuinely giving these things to you forever. Nathan, he, I am actually handing her to you for all time, bestowing her to you as a gift, transferring so that you can receive her. It was written in the imperfect, uh, in Eric, none, literally, genuinely, and actually, even continually, with ongoing and unfolding consequences throughout time, stated as a point of emphasis. God's gift. He's not giving us a piece of dirt. No. He's giving us prolonged life and an unlimited nature. And it's an engaged life. It's not sitting on a cloud. It's doing stuff, walking, Mm -hmm. (laughs) pursuing. And all I'm asking is that you choose to stand up and take a walk independently. That's all I'm asking, and it's your choice. If you do that, I'm going to make you immortal, and I'm going to empower you beyond your wildest imaginings. And this is the gift I'm giving to you forever. One statement. Bob Rasheath. It gets ignored. Genesis 13.7. But Kirk, 
It's so simple. It's so profound. It's so deep. The only reason that somebody wouldn't avail themselves of this is they don't know it's there. And I thank you for sharing it with me.